Hey, Mr. DJ, put a record on. I wanna dance with my baby. <laughs> We now recognize that nature is designed, uh, the geometry, the structure of nature is designed on the basis of what is called fractal geometry. And fractal geometry is unique geometry, not the one we learn in school. The geometry we did learn in school called Euclidean geometry, you can't model nature with it. it does, all those triangles, cones, cubes, and spheres are not what nature really looks like. But in, when we were five years old, in kindergarten, we made a tree. We made a Euclidean tree. We had like a, a cylinder for the trunk and a ball for the top. But obviously that's not nature-like. That geometry is not the nature geometry. We now recognize this new geometry that really came into our world in 1983 with the work of Benoit Mandelberg from IBM called fractal geometry and it's a different version of geometry and it's very exciting but here's the fundamental key characteristic of this geometry built into the nature of the mathematics is a reality that images of the structure repeat themselves in a very self-similar fashion at any level of the organization that you're talking about so if you want to talk about cells or people or civilizations they're all built on the same geometry but the key word for most people to understand is that this geometry links an ancient mystical understanding uh, there was a phrase that uh, people are familiar with, as above, so below. Well, in this new geometry, that becomes mathematical and scientific as a reality. Every atom is a mini black hole, that it has infinite density, that it has infinite potential, that everything has singularity at its center. Um, the vacuum energy, the structure of the vacuum itself, uh, interlinked or entangles all protons, that the proton being the nuclei of an atom, that, that all the nuclei of atoms are entangled because of the structure of the vacuum, that the structure, that, that the vacuum is not a passive vacuum, but an active vacuum that has a role to play in the creation of the, our, our material world, but as well is the structure that connects all things. So, Actually, this is a mathematical rendering of the concept, everything is one, so that it actually is uh, mathematically proven. That's why I can study the nature of a cell and understand the nature of a human because a human is a fractal image of a cell. We, we're made out of cells, we're just a, a large version of a cell. And so that a human body turns out not to be a one thing as we see it in the mirror, but when we really understand, if you could see it with microscopic eyes so you could see what it looked like, you recognize that a human body is a community of upwards to 50 trillion cells. Every cell is essentially a miniature human because virtually every cell has every function that I have in my body, it's already present. As a matter of fact, any function that I do with my body is only because a cell can do that function because I'm made out of cells. Well, I think that um, the world of physics and the world in general is transforming and that there's an opening that's occurring and certainly in physics, um, you know, there's a level of arrogance that's slowly uh, fading away, you know, not so long ago when I started in uh, bringing my work to the physics community some 15 to 20 years ago, the tendency was to think we've got the universe pretty well all figured and all we need is a few little things to work out and then we've ha we have it. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, arrogance in the way, you know, physicists were interacting with new ideas and so on. And so it was extremely difficult to be heard. But uh, since then, a lot of failures in our theories have come forward, a lot of experiments in the laboratory and, you know, data from cosmological instruments and so on have shown us that there's anomalies that we cannot explain with the standard model and all sorts of things are coming up. And so, uh, you know, a certain level of failure of string theory and so on. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it's changed the world of physics.
The same responses of cells to their world are exactly uh, the same kind of behavioral responses that we have in our own world, in the world, the way we live. So that it becomes understandable. This, this is why, for example, why we work on cells in biology. Because if we get an understanding of the nature of the cells, we can apply that information directly to the nature of human biology so that we extend this work. So in looking at nature as fractal, and recognizing that the cell is the fundamental unit of the human body, that the human body is actually built in the image of that cell. Then we start to recognize, look, inside of you right now are 50 trillion citizens. Their, each cell is its own sentient being. When I was culturing these cells, I'd take them out of a person's body, put them in a culture dish, and they have their own life. They didn't need us. It helps to get uh, other physicists to look at it, to get some uh, credibility in the physics I'm writing and to make people aware that we are not living in a finite world that you know the atomic structure itself has this infinite potential within it that you know when people are talking philosophically or spiritually about their infinite nature and all this stuff it doesn't have to be outside the physical world that the actual physical world is what they're talking about that you know philosophy and spirituality are not divorced from the atomic structure that the atomic structure is actually a manifestation of uh, this dynamic of creation that you know we might call uh, consciousness or spirituality and so on so then all of a sudden you look back and you say here we are in a world today with maybe seven billion people and we're on the edge of our own survival we're pushing our our own extermination extinction is looming and because we can't seem to get along with seven billion people on the entire globe of the surface of this earth and then i say you know what inside your body right now are 50 trillion cells they're like miniature humans every cell has their own life every cell has a job every cell gets health care every cell gets protection they live in a world they get paid actually for their work so all of a sudden I say there's a civilization inside of us that is far more adaptable uh, 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 and capable of living in a world than we are and look at it this way they've been here a million years and guess what when you are happy and when you are healthy that means 50 trillion citizens in your body are simultaneously healthy and happy along with you. Now imagine if a whole world could be like a healthy human body. So when we take the scientific foundation of fractals and apply that to our world, then we say, look, you want to understand how to, how to have an economy? Cells get paid. You know, and it's interesting, they're not communists in the sense that the skin cell and the nerve cell gets the same amount of money, man. The nerve cell makes a lot more money, <laughs> but its job is much, it's a much greater job. A skin cell makes less. Every cell is paid according to its job. But basically it says this, there's no success in the system until every cell has gotten its pay and every cell has done its job and every cell contributes to the whole of the community and then you look inside that community and you figure my goodness how do they figure all that out and the answer is well as above so below so if we look at the nature of how it works inside then we are given evidence through nature and through fractal geometry of how to do the same thing out here in our world and then when you start to look at that that's what my work started to extend and go wait a minute we as individual humans are like cells in a larger super organism called humanity and what this new work that I'm involved with spontaneous evolution is concerned about is we're on the uh, on the threshold of an evolutionary leap it's not the evolution of the human the humans already evolved we're not evolving and changing. It's the organization of humans that is evolving and changing. And in the biosphere, we talk about humans collectively as an organism, as a superorganism. So it's civilization that's evolving. And then when you put all these pictures back together, you say, wait, if it's all built on fractals and it's all built on repetitive patterns, then the evolution of civilization would be a fractal image of evolution that has already been played out before. So if we could go back in the biosphere to lower levels, see how the steps of evolution were accomplished, apply that information to our civilization, then we can make the necessary jump that uh, we're being forced to make right now.
the amount of energy available in the vacuum structure inside the proton equates the mass of the universe so that all the mass of the universe is present in each proton in the vacuum energy showing that the vacuum connects all protons. Uh, I don't know that statement, it's not so obvious to see how this relates to consciousness. But if you take all of my per papers together and you understand the theory globally, uh, you know, holistically, you start to, you start to see how uh, that, that, you know, it starts to give a meaning to the word consciousness because people use the word consciousness all the time. You know, like, oh, the universe is all conscious, everything is consciousness. But then there's not really any definition of consciousness. And I think that's what this work kind of brings along as well, is that it starts to describe consciousness as a fundamental dynamics of the forces of nature. Scientists are looking at, at these, the, the satellite data. And uh, every day, every 24 hours, there's an ebb and a flow. The magnetic fields ebb and flow within a certain range, and they're used to seeing that. And all of a sudden, they're watching a spike for both the satellites, and, the, and they're saying, well, you know, what could that be from? And they overlaid it onto a map of dates, and it was at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, September 11, 2001. 9 a.m. is 15 minutes after the first plane hit the first tower. It took about 15 minutes for the images to make it around the world to yes. circulate through the media. And what the scientists discovered was the, the genuine, uh, untrained emotional response, heart-based response of the global population uh, was so powerful when we had it collectively that it actually influenced the very fields of the earth that connect us and sustain all life. Now some of that response was fear, some of it was sadness, some of it was shock, some was compassion, some was anger. So that's why I say it was untrained. But it was collectively occurring in the same moment in time. And the scientists said, oh, you know, humans have the ability to actually influence the very field that connects all life. It gives a, a whole new meaning to the Gaia concept of us on, on a, a living body. This led to a series of experiments to determine what about human emotion was affecting those fields. And what they found is that the human heart creates the strongest electrical field and the strongest magnetic field of any organ in the body, uh, much more than previously thought. So the, the human heart can be up to 100 times stronger than the electrical field of the brain, but the human heart is about 5,000 times stronger magnetically than the human brain when we create a certain condition within us that is induced by following the principles of our most cherished spiritual and ancient traditions. This isn't about religion. It's about a heart-centered experience that can best be described in Western words uh, as care, uh, appreciation, gratitude. And when we do that, what we do is we set up a, a condition between our heart and our brain that's called coherence. The signal between the heart and the brain, the communication, uh, when the feeling is optimum, that signal can be measured about 0 0.10 cycles per second, 0 0.10 hertz. And that quality of the signal is what attunes us to this, this field that connects everything. By following some of our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions without the religious, the, the rules and the dogma, right. this is about our connectedness to the earth and to one another. All the other stuff came along later.